childish or mature, or as Sandy said, you have to call it at your age. So I can the part two of at your age. Let's look first at the verses that we read last week in Ephesians 4. Now notice where it says, this will continue. Remember it said, I told you I should have read that verse this morning. Before that, it says, God gave gifts to the church. You know who gifts he gave to the church? The leaders, the pastors, the teachers. And he said he gave them to the church to teach them to uh, know God and do his will and also to build up the church, God's uh, people, the body of Christ. And so we have a purpose. This is not uh, getting mature like it's something on your bucket list. Well, if I go to Grand Canyon, I'd like to read War and Peace, maybe get mature. No, it's get mature for a purpose. And so this is we understand this will continue us teaching and learning and growing till uh, we come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature. So you want to keep learning and growing and doing till we're all come, we're all united in following Jesus Christ, being mature, how mature, what's our standard? Measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Wow, there's our goal. And we can quit growing when we get all be as mature as Jesus Christ, which means we don't quit growing. So he says we will no longer be immature like children. That's our goal. It's all right to act four when you're four. But it's not all right to act like four when you're 40. That's what he's saying here. It's time to grow up and not be a kid anymore. Now, the problem is we all do this, son. We act like kids, but we want to grow up. So we talked, I'm not going to read past you once from last week, so I'll start on number nine. I did ask at eight last week, number nine. I want it now. I want it now. I want my ice cream now. No, you have to eat supper first. Or you no, I want candy now. I want to go swimming now. And sometimes we can act like that. We don't want to put off anything. We want to do everything now. I think this is the same I want an ice cream now. You know, that's the way we get. Because we don't get it now. We don't learn to put off things. So I want to tell you about a study that was done. It's very famous called the Marshmallow Experiment. They did it. In the 60s, published it in the early 70s, they would take a child, you can see one here, and put him in a room with a marshmallow and say, all right, now listen, uh, i got to go out of the room. You can either eat this marshmallow, or if you wait to bring it back, I'll give you another marshmallow, you have two. So eat it now, or wait, and if you wait, two marshmallows. And then, of course, they had the camera on watch it. And some of the kids, as soon as you don't left the room, he snatch it up with his mouth. <laughs> and then some of them, you see them on the video, and they're going, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, they left them around, they're looking everywhere, and finally they eat it to that way. And then some of them, they wait the whole 15 minutes, and they get two marshmallows. Delayed gratification. Now, the interesting thing was, they followed up on these children and how they reacted in the marshmallow experiment. A few years later, they interviewed their parents how these children were doing when they were teenagers and graduated high school. The ones who delayed gratification, who waited so they could get two marshmallows, got a lot higher grades, a lot higher than SAT, went to college more, had less problems with substance abuse, were more socially. In every area, they were better. They followed them, continued to follow them for 40 years after that experiment to see how they did. And in every area of life, in their health, they were less problems with obesity, uh, in their families, in their careers, in their finances. In every area, the one who was willing to wait did better in life. So this was the conclusion of the survey. This series of experiments proved the ability to delay gratification was critical for success in life. And I believe that's still true. The ability to delay gratification. And I said, I gotta have it now, I gotta have it now. It's more like a 40 year old. Now, I'm not saying you can't have good, some good stuff now, but sometimes, you know, instead of getting in deep, depressing, crushing debt, we need to wait on some things. And save up some money, and I don't think we have to have it all right now. And, and we realize that even this growth 
takes time. Our growth in our marriage takes time. All of these things. To be willing to say, I, I don't want to wait. So maturity is, you usually have to wait on and work for good things. Okay? We understand that. We don't always get ice cream now. we got to do things. And, and sometimes we have patience and work for it, not just get it because we want it. All right, that's maturity. Number two, or number ten, really. I don't like you. Now maybe a, a child says that to a parent because the parent said, all right, you, have, you, you disobey, you have to sit on the couch for 15 minutes. I don't like you. Now it's not that they don't like the parent. They don't like sitting on the couch. But they connect the two and say, I don't like you. Unfortunately, that's what a lot of adults do. We connect something the person does and then we say, I don't like you. When it's real, we don't like that action. In marriage and in a lot of other things, why we don't like you. And then we see even uh, consequences of, I mean, teenagers saying, I don't like you, and saying things, calling them in on social media, and some young teenagers even are so hurt, hurt by it that they take their own lives. So this is, you know, we, it's an immature thing to say, yes, I don't like you because we don't like something you do. So I just sort of want to review, here's some wrong reasons to dislike somebody. Number one, color. I think that's appropriate to say again that we all understand. You don't dislike somebody because they're different color, their shade of skin is a little different. The more than you do, if their hair color is different, their eye color is different. We believe, the Bible teaches, God made everybody. We're all relatives. We're all descended from the first couple. And we're all humans in God's image. And so there's no reason for anyone to say, I don't like you because I don't like your color. And that applies to all colors, by the way. That, there's no reason to say, I don't like you because you're black. I had a black person I knew, and he did this, and I don't like black people. Or I knew a white person did this, and I don't like white people. Or I knew somebody from, uh, you know, the, the cis color, whatever. In that city, that's like the four notes saying, I don't like you because you're giving me some cows, so I don't like you. We don't dislike somebody because of the color. And if we add, we need to say, God, I'm sorry, that's not right. We don't dislike somebody in the country they're from. Maybe, uh, maybe you say, well, I don't like Russia, and they're from Russia, so I don't like them. How silly is that? <coughs> we think everybody from Russia is bad, or they're from Afghanistan, and that's the one we had a war with. Well, I don't like them. That's four-year-old stuff. That's not adult. That's not mature. You don't dislike somebody because of the country they're from. Or the uh, accent. Now, I say this because it aggravates me sometimes when some of these northerners cut down our southern accent. <laughs> and these are the people that say, I'm going to go pop the cop. <laughs> and I'm going, I'm going to get dressed up to go to the pot. <laughs> well, I don't get dressed up to go to the potty. I just go. But, you know, when you pronounce party as potty, don't tell me about my accent. Okay? And if you're up north, you hear me talking. But it's silly to look down on somebody or dislike them. But you know, if you know, we're from another country, they have an accent. Why well, dislike them because they have an accent? How silly is that? How four-year-old is that? See? If they can speak a second language with an accent, that's better than the second language I can't speak at all. Or their personality. Now, I mean, not their behavior, but their meaning. I mean, some people are more... Boisterous and loud and talking to some quieter. You know, I mean, sometimes we let the people who are the fun of oh, we think they're nice and the people who are quiet, what's wrong with them? Thank God we got some quiet people. If everybody talked all the time, nobody listened. You know, some people are more passionate, some are more peaceful. God let us have all kinds of personalities. Thank God there's a difference in the world. I'm born with people, we're all the same. Don't dislike somebody because of personality or their income. You may look down on people who have less income. I don't like them. They don't, they don't have much. They're poor. Or you may just like people who have a lot of money. Who do they think they are? Isn't that silly? Now, some of them may, you know, if their behavior was bad, the way they got that money, I don't like that. And I don't like what some corporations do in America. And I, I'm not going to talk about that now. But that doesn't mean we just dislike somebody because they have more money or less money. 
We don't dislike somebody because of their appearance, I hope. This is a lot of things with the, with the teenagers and children because of their appearance. They mock them and it hurts young people. And surely you have a lot. I don't like them because they don't look good. How silly is that? See, all of these reasons are poor, immature reasons to dislike somebody and yet we see people in society doing that. Adults who should know better, who should be mature, are judging people and disliking people because of that very thing list. I, that is not an imaginary fantasy list. That is a true list that people all the time, and you still see it all in our society today, are doing. Disliking, disliking people because of that. And it's immature, and it's silly, and it's wrong. So what is maturity? It's two things. Deal with the issues instead of attacking the person. All right, let's say early in your marriage, you have a fight over money. And a lot of marriages have fights over money, or disagreements. When you have that fight or that disagreement, you don't just go straight to the, I don't like you because you spent too much money, which is a lot of people. You idiot, you're stupid, that is, you're the dumbest person. See that? You're not dealing with the issue, you're dealing with the person and tearing them down. When it is the issue, we need to talk about our spending. We got this, we have to spend less because this debt is killing that can barely pay the minimum payment. Deal with the issue. Instead of attacking the person, that just makes it, you, know, you hurt the other person, you, you don't deal with the real issue, it's just a whole wrong thing, and it's immature. And, that's, and this is also in everything in life. Let's deal in our society, in our government. Deal with the issue instead of attacking the person. And let me go, this one relates to it. Deal with the behavior instead of the identity. Which is what we're seeing so much of in our society today. We're having this problem because we're, we're trying to deal with it in. Well, he's a policeman. He must be bad. We're still, instead of dealing with behavior of one policeman or a few policemen, we're saying, they're a policeman, they are bad. How immature is that? That is not mature. That is not good sense. But that's what we're seeing. Or all white people are like this. Or all black people are like that. That's dealing with their identity instead of behavior. The issue is not what their identity is. The issue is what do they do? And if they did something wrong and, and lean on somebody's neck till they kill him, yes, let's deal with that behavior. That's the issue. That's maturity. That's right and wrong. And when we deal with it immature, is when we get in a lot of problems. I hope we'll all take that to heart. All right, let's move on to something else. We act impulsively when we act immaturely or childishly. Uh, a few years ago when my granddaughter was young, she was two, we were out next to the water somewhere, and she was just going to step out. She was looking off into the deep water if we hadn't grabbed her. She's just childish. She just doesn't think about things. But when we're adults, we should think about what is going to be the reaction when I post that social media comment, when I say that thing to my wife or husband, when I spend that money. So maturity is think first. Think of the possible income before you say it, before you do it. Don't just, just well, I couldn't have my thoughts on it. That's the word you're 40-year-old behavior is different. We, we think about whether it's right or wrong. Okay. Number 12, everybody in this room, they're all going to that part day. They all have the same toy. Everybody else all my birthday. And so we get sucked into that, and don't tell me there's not this kind of pressure, peer pressure on adults, because there is. And there's more and more peer pressure on us to conform to what the general political thing says we should do. And as Christians, we have to go by what God's Word says, not by what culture says. So let's look at this verse in Romans. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Doesn't that start how you think? 
I think God's way. I believe God's word. I want to follow that. And so then I do what that is, whether or not. Now, I'm not saying be weird on purpose, which some people like to do. And that's right. You want to be weird on purpose? Okay, that's your business. I'm not telling you to be weird on purpose, but I am saying to be different if necessary. Oh, now, this, is, this gets in the hard stuff. Let's not act like it is. Because it's easier for us to go along and get along. Go along with what everybody else is saying is right and wrong right now. Whatever issue that is on sex and marriage and gender and, and anything else you can mention, whether it's right or wrong, we, we get it from what God's Word says, not from what the culture and society says. But it's so easy to just go along and conform. And he said, don't conform. Okay? All right. Now, this is for all. I'm kind of bucking so up, but I'm, I'm as tempted just as you are to just go along and get along with what everybody else says. But we have to go along with what God says. And be different if necessary. It's maturity just because everybody else is going that part of the meeting I have to go. This is a serious looking bunch this morning. I need a joke or something. All right. Number 13. If I don't get my way, I'm not. You know, if we're not going to play by my rules, I'm taking my ball and I'm going home. You know, I'm going to pout. Or I'm going to whine. Or I'm going to manipulate. Or I'm going to stir up this game so much you don't want to play. You know what else can do that stuff? If we don't get our way in something, we can act like that. And that's immature, not mature. See, we don't... Uh, I think I, I think I got next to maturity. My personal preference is not what's most important. Now I'm not saying your personal preference is not important. Okay, if you want to go to this restaurant or that, I mean your preference is important. It's not what's most important. The maturity is understanding that following the Lord is personal, but it's also a team sport. It's also what other people are involved with, which is why I said the same grace command is love your neighbor and yourself, because it's not just all me. It's the whole world is right here in this circle. So let's say you say, well, I didn't like one of those songs you sang this morning. Well, that's your personal preference. But you know what I think? I think you're saying anyhow, unless we're singing worship day or something. We're singing a true Christian song, I think you're saying anyhow, you love your best favorite song. Or uh, I think they'll start service at a different time or something. Well, that's your personal preference. But we got to go along and get along. And those are simple things, but, you know, in, in, in your marriage, you've got to get in something. You want to have a happy marriage. We don't all get to go to vacation where we want to. All the time we've got to give a test. And last year, I went to the beach. <laughs> that's not my favorite vacation. But you know what? She loves the beach. So the guy that I am, we went to <laughs> And I didn't go down there whine and complain. I said, let's eat somewhere good while we're here. <laughs> <laughs> and, but, you know, but then she said, then the next year we'll go somewhere you like. You know, so that, you know, you give and take. It's not all your, your personal preference as a maturity is not the main thing. It's, it's we got, we got to work out with everybody and with especially with what God wants. And so that's maturity. We have to grow up and understand that if we're going to really have joy and love in our life. This is the last one I want to talk about today, but then I have three good things for children. And that it's not fair. Now look at this picture of this girl. I mean, you can see ladies for me coming out of her eyes. It's not fair. I don't know. I didn't know you could look at me. It's not. <laughs> you know, you don't see what people are pointing at different people when I preach everything. Well, we're here. But you can look at me. But you can see that sometimes. It's not fair. Now, sometimes it isn't fair. And I and please don't say, uh, shouldn't we deal with issues that are not fair? And I say, absolutely. I'm not, I am a Mr. Personality who loves fairness and justice. I want that. That's why I watch westerns, because you get the bad guy. He's either in jail or shot by the end of the movie, okay? And that's what I like. I like fairness. I, I, and this is the hard one for me, because I'm so 
uh, in tune with fairness that it really gets me when I see things that are not fair. I see a person who is just really giving their life to God and they're serving Jesus and they get cancer at 40. That doesn't seem fair. And I see this guy who lives like a dog and mistreats everybody and, and he, he lives to be 80 or 90 or 100 and he's a multi-millionaire. Even though he cheated his way to there. I said, that's not fair. But what we need to understand is life is not always fair. Not in this world. Jesus told us that it's not always fair. I want to be fair. We try to make fairness. We all seek justice. As certainly as, as, a, as a group of people, we ought to seek justice and do it in your own way. I'm not saying don't try to seek to make things right. I am. Having said that, though, they're not always going to be fair. And as you grow up, you see that it's just not, and we can't just sit there and be bitter and angry at God and just quit because things aren't fair. And we realize they're not always going to be fair. And so the majority is life isn't always fair. It's fair sometimes. A lot of times there's fairness. But not always. But God is good. But God is good. We have to trust God in this. There is a fair, just God who someday is going to set everything straight and everybody will be judged and that we have heaven to wait us and whether you die at 14 or 104, you can go to heaven as a Christian and follower and God has that place for us and we have to have faith in God and yes, I trust you God. I don't know why you're doing this. I don't know what's going on, but I trust you. That's maturity. Life's not always fair, folks. But God is good. All right, now I want to say there's three things that children say and do. A bit more than that, but I want to talk about three real quick things that children that are good that we should be like them. Number one, when children say why, why we have an imprisoned grandson, why, why did that guy just do that on TV? I mean, I, if I watch sit and watch the TV show with him, he asked me literally 25, 30 questions. I mean, just, so why did he do that? Why is it? Listen to me. Why is it? Why are you? Why did you call that lawnmower stupid, Paul? <laughs> <laughs> because it is stupid. <laughs> you know, but he's always asking why. But you know, that's a good thing to want to learn. It's a good thing for us to continue to learn. And I know <clears throat> sometimes we have to say, I, we can say, God, I don't understand why. And we still have to trust him, but it's still good to learn and ask and seek knowledge. So that's still a good thing in our lives. Right number two is run and hug. I still like it when you're children come and run and hug you. Good morning, Papa. Hi, Papa. Bye, Papa. Boy, I like that. And it's killing me. I hate that we can't, we're not having much physical contact now with this coronavirus. But I, I at least want to shake everybody's hand and give a hug or hug. Have you on back? I, I, and I think we are made to need that. We need physical touch. We need it for our health, for our mental health, for our emotional health. We need physical touch. And it's still a good thing. I can say, well, I'm not a hugger. Well, then you be a, a handshaker or a backpacker. Backpacker? There we go. Do, you know, somehow do something where we show we need that to show that, hey, I like you. I care for you. You're important to me. And being somehow physical, that is a good thing that children do. And then the last one today is have a humble, teachable spirit. So good. Saints have been teaching our grandchildren and others just during this uh, virus and even the summer. And they're so excited to learn these things. It's so good to see that. People have that humble, teachable spirit. And Jesus said something about that. About that time, the disciples came to Jesus, and here's what they asked. Who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And here's what he, what he did. He called a little child and put the child among them. Then he said, I tell you the truth. Amen, amen. Unless you truth, and you turn from your sins and become like little children, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. So anyone who becomes as humble as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. What did Jesus say was great? Humble like this child. You want to be great? You want to know what God considers great? 
you be humble like this little child. And if you think it said, I am great, then you've got to be exactly flip the opposite of what it is in God's before. If you can get on your knees before God and humble yourself, you're still too big in your own eyes. And then he said one other thing comparing to the children. He said, if, uh, the truth, anyone who doesn't receive the kingdom of God like a child will never enter. Like a child who just receives a gift that you give to him, that's how you receive what God has given. When we humble ourselves and receive the free gift of salvation, God is glad to give it to us. When we humble ourselves and say, God, I need you to live as I should as a husband, as a, as a, a wife, as a father, as a mother, as a Christian, as a worker, I need you, God. When we humble ourselves and say, I'm glad to help you and empower you and strengthen you. If anybody here has never received Jesus as your Savior, then it's simple as this, God, I want to receive you. I humble myself. Let me tell you a quick story about, this is my grandson, this is a few years ago. <clears throat> and uh, one day, I told him to do something. I don't even remember what it was. Well, you shouldn't do that. You need to do this. And, and he just completely disobeyed me, right? And his father saw it. So I said, well, Come here with me. We took him up to the room, and I don't know what went on in that talk, but when William came back down, he had tears in his eyes. And he said, Papa, I'm sorry I didn't do what you said. I'll always do what you tell me to do. And he gave me a hug. And we were back together. You know that's what God wants? He just wants you to come and say, God, I'm sorry I didn't do what you said. I'll always do what you want me to do. And that, you can be saved, you can get back right with God, we've been away from Him, we can just fall with Him. That's what God wants. He doesn't want you to, mem I mean, his memory's good, but I mean, we don't have to go through any long course, we just have to come and say, I'm sorry, and come to God. And whoever's grace the kingdom of heaven is the one who is humble like a child. Let's bow our heads for prayer. If anybody is listening on Facebook Live or YouTube or even here this morning who's not a Christian or you're away from God, all God wants you to do is what we did. I'm sorry I went away from you, God. I want to do what you say. I come to you. I follow Jesus. And pray and accept Him and turn to Him. Thank you, God, for this day. And I pray all that I know that some of these things are for me. I don't claim to have reached the standard of Christ in maturity. I pray you'll help me to grow up. Help us all to grow up. To learn, to have from this experience, to walk with you, uh, to do what is right, to come to the unity of faith and we're, and we're reaching people, doing your will, building the church. God, help us and strengthen us for that. If there's somebody here or somebody else, I pray they'll pray right now and seek to be made right with you, through Christ. We love you. We honor you. Strengthen us. Bless our nation. We need you, Father. Bless our leaders, our governmental leaders, our church leaders, our business leaders to do the right thing, to be wise. Help us have unity and peace and your will, and even I pray you'll keep us from this, this virus that it'll stop. But we need you, God. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for being here this morning and uh, being a part of our service and visit from Mississippi. We're glad you're here today and everybody else. Uh, I want to mention this one announcement. What we do to save money is we have.